My name is Dave Andrews. I'm on the board of directors of the Historical Society and uh, Local History Net. Um, I'm with my newfound history friend, uh, Jane Gordon. Jane is what, three years now in, in Damascada and a great uh, asset she's been since she's come here uh, out of Concord, Massachusetts. Oh. Jane is currently vice president of the Coastal Senior College. Uh, she's a uh, Louisa May Alcott. Not. <laughs> what about Thoreau? Are you many about Thoreau? Are many about Thoreau? Um, she's done great things in in Concord and in the state of Massachusetts. Taught many courses on many subjects. I learned from her friend Joan, who's sitting right there. I will not tell jokes, but till later. Um, from her friend Joan, that you you were the official teacher of, of docents in. Concord, do I get that? Yep. 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 You had to take the course from Jane before you were allowed to lead tours, I don't know about driving cabs, but to, uh, to be <laughs> certified by, the, by Concord to talk about it. And, uh, and um, she's always been very interested in landscape, reading the landscape, and um, she's developed this program that we'll do today. There. there will be um, there will be some uh, uh, we'll be talking to the audience so um, if anybody wants to move further up front or run out the door or run out the door um, if you can we'll be looking for answers back from people so you know, watch me in so we don't get three or four people talking at once and in the back particularly um, if you can't hear we do ask everybody to use their outside voices. But if you can't hear in the back, raise your hand and we'll repeat the question. Like that. Good. I'm yeah. there. Yeah, I just went on with this All right. thing. All right. right. Yeah. yeah, what he's saying is you can't escape. This is your only chance to escape because we really want to make this um, very much um, participatory. And as, as Dave just said, I, I taught a course, a local history course, in my old hometown of Concord, Mass. for almost 25 years, um, so I appreciate the depth of local history knowledge that's in any any community. So not coming in to be the expert tonight, but coming in with um, kind of a way of looking at things and a lot of questions that I think might be helpful, um, get us all working together. And I'll explain all that um, more in just a couple of minutes. Um, just a little quick bit of background. I was going to be teaching a course for the senior college. Um, when we were all trying to do bicentennial programs, remember back then? Yeah. <laughs> um, and the course was going to start like March 15th, 2020, um, never happened. But the course was called Seeing 1820 Today. And it was basically looking at um, how you look at a landscape and find traces of the past that are kind of hidden in the landscape, but that you can actually find um, as evidence of the past of the past if you know where to look. And, um, and because, again, I'd only been living here um, since 2018, um, loving the place but not being an expert, I wanted to get together with people from local historical societies and the class was actually going to be meeting at several very specific places so we could really kind of practice looking at the landscape. Um, and when I got in touch with South Bristol Historical Society and met Dave, um, he immediately said, I know a perfect place we can use as a case study, and that would be Clark's Cove. Um, and so, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk a good deal about Clark's Cove tonight, but um, we're, we're basically taking the ideas from, you know, what we were going to do as that class and using them in a, in a different way, in a different way tonight. And the, the fundamental question we were going to be asking in that class was, what can you come to learn about you know, the history of a place that you can really only learn by being in that place and not by any other means? So you know, immersion in an actual location is, is, is huge. And of course, you're doing it all the time with the, with the historical society. So just a quick little bit of background on my approaches to history. And I've worked all my life um, in 
museums and historic sites and for the National Park Service, um, usually either as the director or the director of education or some kind of consultant or, or board member. And, and there's a f several things that, I, that I've come to really realize. Um, one is obviously the main connection we have is to people, right? Where people are interested in people. And if we take the documentary evidence we have about people's lives and we take our own imagination and our, our understanding of human behavior, you know, we can, we can learn a lot. And one of the questions that I always love to, to think about is what kept people up at night? What did they worry about at any particular time period? We know what keeps us up at night, right? We know the worries we have today. What were people worried about in 1820 or 1920 or any other time period? And I found that really looking at that and looking at the stories of people's lives, just the drama in the everyday um, and, and the problems they faced and the dilemmas they were in, the choices they had to make, just makes history so much more, more interesting. Um, and it always has from the time that I was a guide on Lexington Green in Lexington, Mass, when I was 16 until now in my 70s. Basically the same, the same kind of interest. Um, the other thing, uh, the second thing is that I've come to realize in so much of the work I've done over too many decades, that you, you really need people who can see broad patterns and, and you know, issues and connect to the broader history, uh, international and national and regional history, but you need people who have that really deep local knowledge of a place um, the way you do with South Bristol. And when you make that combination of people who can look kind of at the broader aspects and then people who can really go deep, then you've got something really good. And that kind of a shared investigation is, is huge. And I was involved in a lot of projects where people were coupling historians, you know, academic historians, with people from the local societies. And they were coming out with some, some really, really great, great stuff. And that detective work, um, that kind of sleuthing part of history, that investigation, is, is, is huge. And so I, I'm coming basically with questions based on the background that I have, and hopefully you're kind of coming, and we have some people who have spent many, many years researching this, but all of you have good local knowledge. You, you're going to come up with some answers based on the background that you have um, that, I don't, that I don't have, certainly. So I think together we're going to make a, a good investigative team, as it were, if you're, if you're game for this. Um, the other thing, and Dave alluded to this, is that, to me, um, the observation of the geography of a place is crucial. Looking at the landscape, asking that question, why did particular things happen here, right here and not somewhere else? And that's the kind of questions we're going to be looking at in just a minute with the slides that we have. Why here? So to just kind of keep that, that question in your mind as, as we go along. And we talk about um, a lot of, about reading landscapes. Now we know about reading books, right? We know how to read text. Some of you are really good at reading pieces of art. If you're a cultural anthropologist like Jill, she knows how to read objects. And we use that word read. Some of you can read music really quite well. Um, there are people who can read um, forest landscapes. And if you go to the Beers Allen Preserve and look at those interpretive signs, they really help you to learn how to read that forest and understand what it is that you're actually looking at when you're walking the trails through that preserve in, in Bristol. I'm living by the Damariscotta River and I'm still trying to understand how to read that river to understand the, you know, the intersection of the tides and the currents and the rock outcroppings and the contours of the shoreline and the temperature and the weather and the seasons and how that all, how that all kind of works together. So I'm, I'm trying to learn to read a river. Um, and so um, a lot of you, I think, are experts at reading the water, those of you who uh, are out on the water all the time. So that, that's what we're really talking about. So when we're talking about reading a landscape, the questions are, what is it that we're, we should be looking for? And what can those things tell us um, about what happened there? And what things that we're seeing um, are functioning the way they always did, and what things have changed over time? Okay, some things are 
present, you can still see them from the past, and some things are only almost like ghostly traces. Um, and I was fascinated by the fact that, you know, growing up as a New Englander, I was fascinated by ghost towns out west, and I, a lot of family vacations going to ghost towns. And then realizing we have things like that here, but they're, they're kind of hidden, and we just have to, again, know how to, how to look for them. And it's almost like we have layer after layer after layer of history that we have to peel back um, like an onion, right, to, to really see um, what secrets are there to be, to be revealed. And just finally, um, historians talk about a cultural landscape. And um, cultural landscape, the Park Service, the National Park Service, defines as a geographic area including both cultural and natural resources. So what the heck does that mean? All right, so cultural is basically the built environment, what man has put there, all right, that wasn't already occurring. And then, of course, the natural world, the flora, the fauna, the topography, but it's not quite as simple as that because, you know, to be able to say that's natural and that's man-made in this time in 2021 gets really, really blurry. It's a pretty porous boundary because man has been shaping this landscape here for at least 12,000 years and the land shape has been shaping us at the same time. And so that kind of blurry boundary between what's natural and what's man-made um, sometimes gets people in trouble if they try to, you know, just lump things in one category or another. So um, the Park Service, in its great wisdom, has come up with a terminology, of, and this will, you'll love this, historic vernacular landscape. <laughs> An historic <laughs> vernacular landscape, and that's what we have with Park's Cove. Um, we know, right? Um, and the way they define that is a landscape, and it's, listen to this, and it does make sense. A landscape that evolved through use by the people whose activities or occupancy shaped that landscape through social or cultural attitudes of an individual, family, or community. The landscape reflects the physical, biological, cultural character of everyday lives. Function plays a significant role in vernacular landscapes. They can be a single property, such as a farm, or a collection of properties, such as a district of, a, of historic farms along a river valley. Examples include rural villages, industrial complexes, and agricultural landscapes. So that's a, you know, kind of a long definition, but again, fancy language, but vernacular basically means it wasn't designed by an architect. All right, it wasn't a planned community. It's something that kind of evolved and grew as people's needs changed over, over time. And they're responding to the characteristics of the place. They're responding to the challenges of living there. And they're responding to the changes in the outside world. So all of those activities are being shaped by the landscape. And their, and their decisions are reshaping the landscape. And the landscape's, re, you know, kind of dictating what they can do and cannot do there. So um, that's, that's all part of that kind of dynamic of the vernacular landscape. So without more definitions here, I, I want to get going on this. Um, and just remember that eternal question, why here? Um, Dave's going to show us a slide, and we're going to look at it together. And I have some questions to ask for all of you um, before we move on to the next one. And we'll try to get the answers as we, as we go along here as, as well. And I have to say, I, I'm fascinated by the way that Dave approaches the landscape because he thinks like an engineer and, and he thinks about you know, what people had to have and what had to be there in order for people to do a particular thing. So that's, that's huge. That's absolutely huge. So the first slide, yeah. Okay, great. All right, so what, what we want to look at with this, and if you can't see, come, come forward a little bit, make me. Uh, a little bit more. The question I have, what are all the components that we can see in this landscape? What are all the things that you see, both man-made and quote-unquote natural, that, that, are part, that, that are part of this place? And let's just list as many components as we can. So what do you see when you're looking at that slide? Trees and water. All right, trees and water. And when we're looking at water, by the way, um, what kinds of water are we looking at? Or what, what configurations of water? All right, you got an estuary, cove. you've got a cove. Different depths. Different depths of the water, exactly. And with the trees, again, you've got different 
you, you see the forested part, and then there's other other trees that seem to be like smaller groupings of trees. And there's freshwater too, right? Mm -hmm. And there's freshwater. Everybody, yeah. Can everybody see that? The darker part, which is huge. All right. So you've got salt water. You've got fresh water. You've got trees. Anything else you see? Roads. Roads. All right. See roads. You see fields, right? Somebody said fields. Uh, I know they're there. That will count. They're there, okay. <laughs> and you see, you see areas that do not have as much uh, as much forest coverage, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. 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 Anything else? Docks. Docks. Boats. Mm -hmm. Boats. You see boats. You see docks. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the kind. I mean, the, the, you're getting the idea. That's the kind of thing. Just trying to get all of those things. Out. Now, the question is, why did people settle here? Why was there such a concentration of people who settled here? And Dave, what would that time period would be? What the seventeen? Um. Yeah. Um, very briefly, South Bristol kind of has two settlement histories. We're going to be talking about settlement history after seventeen thirty. Right. So the settlements here. Maybe a little bit later, but we're yeah. still talking the 1730s, 1740s. Okay, right, so the Dunbar, so that period. Yeah, so say 1730s, 40s, 50s. The important question is, people could have clustered in a lot of different places, but why did they choose the, the place we just looked at? Why did they choose that? Yeah, I'm sorry I don't know anyone's name. <laughs> you do. Oh. No count. Oh, of course I do. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what it is? I, I keep calling you Bill Fitch because of the Fitch thing. <laughs> you Bill Fitch in my mind. Okay. It was a Tide Mill. <laughs> I'm sorry. Tide Mill. Yeah, but there wasn't Not a Tide Mill. No. But let's all right, but but let's take that's, what you're saying. That's let's a take good what Bill's saying. Okay. So there became a Tide Mill, but what made it a place where they would put a Tide Mill? Why didn't they put it, you know, in a different place? Why was that well, a flat, place? flat land for farming? Okay, you got good land for farming. Yep. And what do you need? What and that's that's really important because a lot of these people, that's what they're that's and what water, they're starting out. Water out. for transportation. You got water for transportation. Shelter. Shelter in the water. You got shelter, right? You got shelter. And what do you need to run a tide mill? Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, say anything. You're gonna you're creating water power, right? And Bill, maybe you can explain it. Uh, Bill, I'm sorry. Dave, can you explain it the way you explained it to me the other day? What were well, the ingredients you need? And you're absolutely right. What were the ingredients you need to run a the, the, the For original settlement, and this is Barbara Rumsey, who is the historical historian over in Boot Bay Region. She writes very well about what the, what the original settlers were looking for. One, they were farmers, so they were looking for land that they could farm. They, Second, they needed to be close to the river because that was the only source of transportation. And uh, um, they needed access, in many cases, to the uh, saltwater marshes, the salt hay. All right, wait, wait, okay, wait, okay. don't give it away. Oh, why, okay. you know, because I've been seeing people to figure that out, why the salt, why the salt marshes were important. Mm -hmm. It's the hay, yeah, it's the hay for the hay. for their livestock. Yeah. Livestock. These yeah. Are farmers. Yeah. They also wanted um, they wanted some protection from the, the north. Right. And the west in the winter. They were smart enough to know it's cold here. And they all wanted a good view down the river. And why would you want a good view down? It's you know, let's put a B and B here and have hundred percent cotton sheets, we'll have a boutique in. <laughs> Not exactly, right? It's defensive, right? Defensive, yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> oh, and this is the this is a picture taken from uh, just uh, when you go to Clark's Cove, you take that sharp left to head up, uh, sharp right to head up towards the Darling Center. You go straight ahead. Uh, there's a little gravel road, and this is their view. This is probably you can see right down here. You have Good farmland, these are apple trees. Um, there's some fresh water available to you, it's kind of behind. 
Um, and, and Dave, why, when you're, and by the way, the orchards, um, they're not using them to bake, you know, apple pie all the time. They need the, the apples for the cider, right? Cider's huge, hard cider. How, what do you need, what do you need to actually, first of all, why do you need a mill? Why do you need a tidal mill? What, what are they, what are they using the water power to do in a tidal mill? Grinding grain, grain. grain, and what's the other kind of mill that would be hugely important? Lumber. Sawmill. Yeah, lumber, sawmill. Okay, so what do you actually have to have to make, can we go back to that first slide, of course, sure, sure, the sure. area? Yeah. What do you have to have um, to have that tidal mill actually operate efficiently? What, what do you need, what are the ingredients that you need for that? Intertidal and, waterfall. Oh, Intertidal water. waterfall. Okay, you've got to have a source of the water power, right? So how does the tidal mill work? You know, I want to make sure you all understand how it works. And maybe you can explain. How does the tidal mill work? Well, the tidal mill works um, due to the change in the elevation of the pond, the, of the well, pond behind the mill that's behind the mill's dam, and and uh, the sea level, water level up here. The uh, the mill works. It uh, it as the tide comes up. Back. Let's start with a full pool here, and the, the, they fill the pool up on the high tide. The tide drops when there's some a couple of feet of differential. They start to, to run the water from the pond, the, the pool above the dam, under an under road. Most of them had an undershoot water wheel, and because there's a, a couple of feet difference, they could generate enough power to run the old fashioned up down sauce or as a grist mill to turn the stone and they would follow the tide down 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 and then as as the tide got very low they would drain the pool then they would close the gates they'd let the they'd let the tide start up and then they'd run the wheel the other way come on and eventually they'd stop it you know they'd fill the pool and then they as the tide dropped again so they could they would saw or they would grind on both sides of the time. And depending on the differential and all that, they could do more or less work. It was not a lot of horsepower, but still it was enough to grind grain. And it would have been enough, and it, we know it's enough to um, saw, saw lumber. And these were very common. There were at least three on the Dam Scotta um, in little estuaries on the side from Oh, pleasant, just above here, actually. Here, and then down, the big one would have been in these booths. And they were uh, in John's Bay. So it was a very common thing. But just to make mm -hmm. a point, sure. yeah. the mill didn't come first. What came first were the settlers, because you have to have what to make a mill work? Customers. You have to have someone who wants their grain grown, mm -hmm. and you have to have someone who wants timber cut. And it was mostly trade and barter. So the mill owner became almost like a store, you know, he'd stock stuff. And he'd take in shingles and you know they'd get they'd get their, their lumber saw on or they'd get their grain done and it became a very sense focus. But initially they were looking for agricultural land, water, a certain amount of protection, but not really, and that view down river. And, and an interesting thing, and what you've all come up with, you know, this is not random, right? So the, the, that cluster of settlement there, there's nothing random about it. Um, they knew that the ingredients they needed, um, and so they looked for the place that had that. So knowing, and, and it's so important, I, I, you know, when I was teaching in Concord all those years, I would have people tell me about, well, there were vortexes that somehow intersected at a certain place. Bullshit. Um, these were practical people making practical decisions, right? Um, and and uh, about where they, where what they needed to do in order to make a living and where they would live. So, so based on the fact that we know that, that we know there was a tidal mill there, as Bill said, what would we expect to find traces of that would be associated with that mill? What would you expect to find? Stone. Some stone from foundation, right? Right? Well, we'll right. Jump to that slide. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I'm, I, yeah. I have this in a certain order, but we're going to just, okay, we'll just right. go. Yeah, the dam. Okay, good. Just to explain, 
This is the song. This is a, an 18, uh, 1860, 1865 um, stereo, stereoscope, stereopticon picture. I've just taken one off. This is this is the song that we know the, the gristmill was on. We'll look up later. This is the old bridge. The new bridge today is, and it really is not a bridge. That's almost the same picture. There is no real bridge there. There's a couple of culverts that control the in and out so it's fresh. This is the, some of the foundation stones of the, the, the sawmill. At the, the other side, it's gone. There's some steep rocks and stuff. But it's there. And for people who, um, not everybody's from South Bristol, can you explain, I want to just make sure people know where we're talking about Clark's Cove and Clark's Cove Road. Um, so if we go from that intersection um, on 129, mm -hmm. Harrington Road and Clark's Cove Road, does everybody know where that four-way intersection is? If you don't, raise your hand. Uh, don't be, don't well, be embarrassed. You don't have to tell everybody. I mean, Dave was telling that me that about way. Clark's Cove for about a half an hour when I first met him. I had no inkling of where he met. <laughs> and I've been at courses at the Darwin Center. <laughs> <laughs> so don't, don't feel embarrassed. Um, is everybody, is okay. everybody driven the road and knows that? Right, we know that. Enough, so we can talk about it. Good. Yeah. Right. Sure. Right. And then, we don't keep going. And then, so if you took, at, at that intersection, if you're coming up from South Bristol, if you took a left, right, on Clark's Cove Road, and you're going to go past the, the Centennial Hall, Town Hall, and all, you're going down that, that hill. That's where we are, right? And, yeah. and so which we, we're, we're, the, river, the river is on the far side, I assume, from here, no, or, we, or we're, is it on the near side? Right? We're on the low side. We're, we're on, on, the, we're on the, the salt side. side. You're on the salt and, side. And this, yeah. this, the road, and what we call the bridge, which is really not a bridge, um, is right about where the, uh, the mill dam was. So that's, but this, if you go there at low tide and you look carefully, you can see that Mother Nature did not do this. These are, these are cut stones. In fact, I went down and looked. You can actually, in a couple of stones, you can see where they cut the stones. And they're sitting there. They were something underneath the, the, the sun. And again, I mean, it just points out that, you know, you look at that and say it's a rock pile, but it's not, right? It's so much more than a rock pile. Exactly. Exactly. So I want to, um, and we can go to that, um, uh, that slide number, whatever we want to do for slide number three there, um, and look at what choices people had to make and what, cha what challenges do you think these people faced living in this area? Um, what, what slide number are we on? Well, it's the one we said that was number three, but we can do any, anything that works in there. Um, Could be anything. Number three for me was supposed to be a, new, a couple of buildings. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're getting well, let's, let's, Doesn't matter? Let's, yeah, let's leave that one. Okay, so what are some of the choices that they're going to have to make and some of the challenges that they're facing? These people who are living in Clark's Cove. Just shout it out. Well, they've got to clear the land. they got to clear the land, right? Yes. It's not automatically done for them unless Native Americans had cleared it. And, and they didn't, they didn't the cross code. There was not only, only reason right. Okay. Trade, trade. Right, trade. All right, trade. there's got to be, you've got, if you've got products, you have to have some way of distributing them and bringing things in, bringing things out, right? Okay. What else? Boats. Boats, so you're going to have something to convey all of that on, right? Absolutely. So how's that going to happen? Growing your own food. Yeah. Growing your own food. Or their animals, too. Yeah, and food for the animals is right. It's right. Absolutely. They needed... Shelter. 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 Absolutely. They needed cash mm -hmm. because you, you didn't... Uh, I mean, it, it was not a cashless society. A lot of right. trade and barter, but they did yeah. have to have yeah. a certain amount of... Yeah, you sure did. Yeah. And trading partners, as we trading mentioned partners. before. Absolutely. Even the manufactured goods, so metal in particular, that they don't have here. Yeah, you have to have things that you can't. Goods. That's right. correct. They have almost, to stuff. In fact, almost everything except that they could whittle out of wood right. or, or grow in the garden, so they needed to. Absolutely. So you have to import the things that you cannot produce here um, on your own. Unless they had a blacksmith. 
Ah, right. So those kinds of services that you're going to need, you're going to have to have somebody who's a, a blacksmith or has that skill. What other kinds of skills are you going to need in a community Lumber. like that? Lumberman. Yeah, oh, right. Um, do you have a specific person who is the lumber man, or are people all doing it themselves and bringing yeah. it into the um, I thought you were going to ask about what. Uh, no, no. <laughs> These people were. They were. And, and initially self-reliant. That is to say, as a group, they did it all themselves. They did not, you would not see early on the Scotch-Irish having uh, a, a blacksmith or a farrier or those sorts of specialized skills. To begin with, they almost didn't need it. Remember, these people are coming here, emigrating either up from um, um, uh, London, New Hampshire, or coming across from Northern Ireland, so we're talking mostly about Scotch-Irish, mm -hmm. and oh, I, I had a question. Okay, so, go. That's only fair. Well, what, yeah. They're landing here, you know, and they've got to start from scratch. What resources, what, what would they do first? Clearly they would, to, to satisfy their needs for security, housing, money, trade, Get the what, what's the, the, the first resource they would yeah. tap? Fish. Yeah. Uh, we're saying no, it, but we're not, back, can you say it again? Clear the land. You gotta clear the land. That's right. And what do they do with the trees? They cut. That's right. They cut the trees as firewood and send all that firewood down to Boston. And that was. And at, at the same time, they're clearing the land. They're sending firewood down. To Boston because that was the first resource they had. They didn't have a sawmill, and they just needed to get the turnips going and keep the wolves out and get the pigs <laughs> so that at least you had a little bit of food. And they used the logs to build. We'll say a log cabin, but it wasn't. It wasn't the type we, we think of. It was actually more of a vertical log thing. Yeah. That's how they start. I'm sorry. Oh, Construction with a vertical. Yeah, with a vertical. Yeah. yeah, and that's the temporary. That's your temporary housing until you can get a more permanent place. They moved out of that and put the pigs yeah. in. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Because you're not going to waste anything, right? Nothing is going to go to waste. Um, absolutely. So you can see that you, you you know you have things that you need for your own survival, but you're also immediately plugged into the rest of the world. When does shipbuilding begin in this area? Where do they get the ships that they're using to send those logs well, down to Boston? Um, you're asking this. I know what. <laughs> I was ready for that. The first known, <laughs> the first known ship or vessel boat mm -hmm. being built in South Bristol was actually at the mill at Bristol. Um, the gentleman, Mr. Amos Gowdy, who in the prime of life drowned in his mill pond and in his uh, state inventory, which is a great one because he's not old and giving everything away, there is a, a, a half-built gunnelo. Everybody knows what a gunnelo is? Well, it's a flat bottom. can be a very big skiff for the sale. It is the pickup truck, utility van, you know, trailer truck, not trailer truck, I guess, but it's the working boat on a river like that. You had everybody rowed back and forth. I mean, Again, we talked about the river is the center of everybody's life. It's, it's, it's the highway, it's the only way of transportation, either in or out. And um, so, yeah. I mean, shipbuilding probably began not long after yeah. um, they settled. I mean, they, they made, we know there was a dugout canoe that went back and forth across the gut. I don't know when, but you can picture it must have yeah. been very early. Yeah. And, and as Dave's saying too, this is so important that, you know, we think today, many of you ha are on the water a lot, but most people think in terms of roads around here, and that's not the way, you know, we need to think about it in the earlier settlement. We need, as you said, we need to think of the river not as a barrier, right, or divider, but as something that's just unifies, it's, as you said, it's the super highway, it's, it's everything. 
um, in these people's lives. It's so important, and everything associated with the river um, is going to be huge here. And if you want to get a, an idea of what a governor will look like, you can just go to um, Strawberry Bank has a has a great example of one. There's usually one under yeah. construction too at the, at the same time. So. Yeah. I didn't think those were going to come up, so you I, never know. A, you I, never I have know. a picture, but not in the slide well, package. How, how would you possibly figure that, that part out? Okay, um, so so I'd like to kind of move on, um, Dave, to that slide number four, um, and that gets into this. Which we, yeah, that it, it gets into something that we kind of touched on earlier, but I want to come back to again. What things in this that you're seeing in this? might have been in place before European settlement, before European settlement, not Native American. Um, and which, which things were modified and why were they modified? And which things were built from scratch? Because again, it gets into that blurry boundary between the man-made and the, and the natural. Anybody can tell on this, which things might have been here before people European settled in this area? The rocks. The ro okay, the rocks were here. The fish weirs. Fish weirs, yeah, Native Americans were using the fish weirs in the same areas, right? Like because of the water drop, yeah. I'm looking, that, is, that probably, that particular slide is the best example because essentially, other than the bedrock and the water, that's all man-made. Um, so. Right, but that's okay. I apologize no, for that. But that, but that <laughs> no, don't, don't apologize because that's, that's part of what I think we have to go through is figure out what was already there, what was built upon, how do they modify what they already had. That's, that's absolutely not, not a problem, not a problem. And we're gonna, and what is that that we're looking at in the middle there? This is, um, they're called flat gates. There are okay. two culverts through there. The fresh water just keeps them open gently. They're designed to let fresh water out. And on the high tide, it prevents uh, salt water from going up into the um, ice pond. In the pond. Right. And, okay. and again, why would that, I mean, you talked about the pond, we talked about the pond, now you're talking about an ice pond, we want to talk about that. Why we want to keep the fresh and salt water separate from each other, right? We will talk about that. Yeah, that's going to be crucial. That's a good question. Yeah. Why did the town spend money right. to, for this expensive relatively expensive thing. Why do they need well, that? Fresh right. water freezes better. Well, it was, I'll, I'll give you a hint, it wasn't there at the time they were cutting ice. We'll talk about that later, hold that thought. Okay. So why did they do it? This is a good, this is yeah. a good yeah. question. Why did the town do that? Possibility of flooding? That wouldn't be my read, but oh, I, it freezes the lower temperature. Uh, we're, we're, we're going off. Think about what's around that pond. This was relatively recent. I mean, this is not a, there was an actual bridge there at one time. Is that for the fire department? No, it's, for the, it's for the residents around the pond. They bought property on a freshwater pond. And they were drinking water. Yeah. Well, maybe drinking water, but it's a freshwater pond because that's what was there, and the town wanted to maintain it as freshwater. Mm -hmm. Can only remember the if those of you who may have been here about the Sherman Marsh and the Sherman Pond controversy. Right, yeah. Yeah, those are, that it was a, a, a real ruckus over that. So maybe they didn't want. It. But that's there. That's there just to keep that pond fresh for uh, for the, for the rest. Of it. And it is interesting, and, and I think that points out that over time, different. You know, different uses, different values in the landscape are, are, are become important, right? I, I was looking at my um, my copy came today of the um, Sierra Club New England or Maine, the Maine branch of the Sierra Club newsletter, and it talked about the importance of salt marshes. There's a whole lead article on the importance of salt marshes today, and it isn't because it's providing hay for our livestock, right? Um, it's because salt waters marshes absorb. Um, you know, the heat and, and, and combat some of the um, aspects of climate change are completely different, a completely different set of values ascribed to the importance of saltwater marshes. So that same thing happens here. The same thing happens here. We're going to get back to the ice trade. In a, yeah, but uh, in let's, let's talk here. about yeah. the, the pond for just yeah, a second absolutely. more. We remember the earliest settlers were looking for 
amongst other things, salt marsh hay, because that was salt. I, I actually put salt marsh hay on our gardens because it doesn't rot, it holds its value. It's, you don't have to do anything, you just go out there with your oxen and you cut it, you cut it by hand. It doesn't, it doesn't have weeds. It doesn't have weeds. Weed it doesn't have weeds. Well, again, it was a major resource in, uh, really, uh, in, at the in, this, in the 18th century, on the South Bristol side of our town, there was only one salt marsh. Mm -hmm. And anyone want to guess where it is today? It's underneath the ice block. That was all salt marsh. Oh and that was the, the final reason that this is, this is, I think, really the first upriver settlement um, um, in South Bristol in, the, in, in its, in its eight, seven, 1700. And in fact, there were deeds that talk about property coming up to ores, O-R-R, ores, salt marsh. And that's what they're talking about there. So there is one that, yeah. another one, if you're exploring in your mind, you know, why would people live here? Why did they live here in the past? That's one, you stand there and say, where's the salt marsh? And you, it doesn't, it, I'm sorry? Where is it in the picture? Where is it in the picture? Oh, let me, I'll go right back to that one. That's, yeah. You might as well see it. Early, that first picture. Right yeah. there. No! Yeah, I can trip you up here. Not the entire area because the pond level is high. This is the salt marsh. It, again, I don't know its precise boundaries, but you can see if any of you are familiar with you know, the coast, some of these coastal rivers, this sort of little estuary in here, um, this is not dissimilar than, um, you know, a number of other places along this river in the Sheepskin. So this probably was salt marsh, there was salt marsh all along there. Um, initially, in 1760, they built uh, a sawmill. What happened to the salt marsh? They didn't care now. Because by 1760, they had, well, they had this. They had cleared land and they were growing English hay. Yeah, so they didn't need the salt marsh hay anymore if they could grow their own. So what happens to the salt marsh? They use it for a different thing to meet their needs. So again, building each thing, building, building on another. Okay. Um, all right. So, so let's see. Where do you want to go next? You want to do um, the one on five there? Yeah. I like. I get the. This 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 was my last one about things that change. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, we can use that. Yeah. I, I got to show this slide anyway. All right. Yeah. Yeah. This is this what is Centennial Hall. Don't tell. Oh, I well, I think everybody knows what the building is. Well, yeah. <laughs> What's happening there? <laughs> this isn't exactly reading landscape, but it's looking at a picture. This is one of my favorite most pictures of all in South Bristol. Is it a lot? Where is that? Armistice Day or something? Yes. Oh, what, what, what war? One. Yeah. Right, and that would be 19... 18. 17, 18. Yeah. It's 1917. 18. Yes. And it is not exactly the armistice. It is the celebration of the end of the war and South Bristol becoming a town because in 1915 when we became a town, you didn't put on a display. It was just like COVID, you know, COVID. I mean, everybody was really worried about it. It was not a time for big celebrations. So this is a combination of Speakers coming, music coming, everybody came to celebrate South Bristol becoming a town. And, see the flags, the American flag, the French flag, the British flag. It's also a celebration of the end of the world. Yeah. And again, there are people who could look at that picture and based on, you know, the, what people are wearing, based on the, the look of the cars, you know, they could probably date that even if we didn't know, if we didn't have those flags straight on the side of the building. So again, that's part of reading the landscape as well. Great. Um, we just learned, yeah. I would like to add my grandmother, Jesse Brooks, sang Star Spangled Banner. Oh, that's wonderful. Fantastic. That's fantastic. 
And that's where that local history becomes so key, because that's part of your own family story, which you know you just can't that can't be supplied any other way. That, that, that's absolutely wonderful. So you want five? Which is yeah, this will this will be good because the only reason the only reason I want to show that is just to look at you know what people did for it for a living, evidence of what people did did for a living. So um, that that's a perfect example of it. What what's happening? What's happening in this scene? Mm -hmm. Harvesting the hay. They're cutting. Yeah. Cutting the English hay. They're cutting the English the hay. Man. And there is a road. Yes. Oh, someone is very observant. Uh huh. Right. Exactly. Oh, sure. Just look. Keep that. See the road. Mm -hmm. Can I see that? Okay. Yes. I'm standing almost exactly in the same spot that the photographer is standing. Oh. Yeah. I, the other day, I was out there, and it took me. A little while to get myself lined up, but that's almost the same picture. Where's the road? It's out there. This is the old bridge road, and that is the new bridge road. You saw the old bridge, and so there's a case where if you saw that photograph, you would wonder what was going on. Again, we're looking at photos here, but Absolutely. this may not be quite so much landscape, but you would. You would uh, oh, have to think, if you saw where the old bridge went across, then you'd say the road has to be in a different place. Exactly. And again, knowing what you're looking at. Can you go back to the one before that? that those are haycocks. And yeah. in the back is a hay, is a hay stack. So they're in the act of breaking up the hay, and each of those cocks is going to be moved and put in the stack, isn't it? And, uh, they said it's a way of work in Pennsylvania. Okay, and <laughs> probably spot. wouldn't yeah, be that this, different. Um, this hay is being loaded, uh, probably going almost, it may be going to, you're looking at this? Yeah. Oh no, this is a wagon, there are the oxen, and there's the wheel, they're loading a wagon in this picture. But they don't leave it on the field, they will put little bundle of No, 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 they just rigged it out to be able to have a pile of yeah. 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 And probably furiously hot and drinking switchable. At what time of year would this be? Can you figure out about when? Late June. Late yeah. June. Yeah. June, July. June, July. Okay. I feel like that's very good. Kind of okay. Excellent. Oh, okay. I'm sure. We, we keep going. Oh, right. That's good. five. No, All right. Yeah. Right. We get six. Um, so let's uh, do seven. So we've seen this before. Yeah. We did that. We did that. Yeah. Okay. What do we do? I look at nine instead of eight. Yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, we passed it. That was the, the two of the dance. Yeah. All right. Do okay, uh, do you have this one right here? That. that well, yeah, I have the yeah. dwarf. Oh, that oh, was that. Oh, okay. That was a song. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So we're that was a song a little before and after. Not, okay. not a problem. So let's, see, well, let's just take a look at this right here, since we've got this off. So what are we looking at here? What are we looking at here? Are we still in Clark's Cove? Oh, yeah. All right. In fact, and you Dave took this picture for a particular reason, I assume. What does he want? What does he want you to be kind of scrutinizing here? So what's the obvious feature of the center? Curving rocks. Yeah. What and are those curving rocks? Right. Is that? Would you? If you saw that, would you say it was man-made or natural? And I'll, it's a little difficult to see, but there was a gap right there. Oh. There's no rocks that live. It's, it's hard to get a good picture of that. And that gap is, is it was was purposeful, right? It's not something that's fallen well, out, or do we know? I would. I his wife said I was an engineer. You that looks to me to be anybody? You made a dam. Ah. All right. Made so a dam. I think that would be a good guess. Um, why would there be a dam there? There's the dam. And uh, a hint might be, you'll notice there are no leaves on the tree and the pond is covered with ice. This is the dam built for the ice, for the ice business, Bristol Ice. Yeah. In the night, late uh, 1870s. Yeah. I, I, it's a little unclear. Yeah. That means that this water is almost assuredly tidal. And this is upstream of the road. If you you know you go you come to the 
bridge there where the old mill was, now you know that. And you start up and there's the house right there on the side, which I just found out belongs to Dirk Brunner, who owns the house up on top of the hill. Not bad. And you walk down, you ask Dirk's permission because he was cutting the lawn, and you walk down and back, and there's a little path, and it takes you right to that little spot. It's so. So let's not, let's let's put you all through your paces here, including including Dave. All right, because this is this is key. If we take kind of a case study, looking at the ice harvesting, which is a is a big deal. I mean, obviously we think of the Thompson Ice House now in South Bristol. Um, and we think of that as that's kind of a local operation with deliveries all over the peninsula. But we're talking about an ice, an ice company, right, that is doing trade all over the world. I mean, literally trade <laughs> to the Caribbean, to Calcutta, you name it. So what? Thousands of tons. And yeah, I, I don't have it in the slide pack, right. but we have pictures of big three-masted, most of them are three-masted schooners loading ice. Yeah, right from right here. These are not right. little boats. These are yeah. very big, and they're not they're not taking it down to be spooked by the, for the bar to have ice. <laughs> right. So, so this was so a, let's this was look, a big business. Let's look at that. This big business, as you're saying, what are the things that you need for ice harvesting? What are the what are the things that you're going to need to have an ice harvesting operation? We already talked about a way to transport it out, right? But what else have, have you have? Say it again. Manpower. You have to have manpower. Well, where are these people going to stay? Dormitories. Yeah, they have to be. It has to be some place for them to sleep, right? And I believe we have evidence of that in the area in Clark's Cove. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The. Yeah. the, the um, I don't. We may uh, not have it in a photo, but we. I don't think it. I. Well, I not quite, but the uh, the red house when you come up the hill, that big four square. Uh, Bruner's house on uh, the house on one side, the big barns the other. We know that house at ice cutting period was a dormitory. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if the next house up, which is a Kelsey house, a big two-story house, probably had people too. There were local people that would come in, and horses. Oh, I gave it away. Didn't I? Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> okay. So you need horses. manpower residences for the manpower, a place, a way to cart the ice away. How do you get? How do you keep? How do you make sure that the ice? in that ice pond is not getting mixed with the water from the coast. So you have an ice house and, and sawdust. Yeah, so you've got to have, all right, so first of all, before we even get to the ice house, right, you've got to, you've got to keep that water, right, pretty fresh, right, up in the, in the uh, a pond or can it be salt? Can it be, can it be a blend of salt and fresh? So ice no, is being cut. No, it can't be a blend of salt and fresh. No, right, so it has to be fresh, right? So what do you need to make sure that the water from the ice pond and the water from the cove don't mix? You have some kind of a dam, right, to keep them separate, right? Then how do you get the ice from the ice pond to the place where you're going to store it, the ice house? How, what, what do you have for that? And I think you've got something that gives you a I can, sense I can, of that. Yeah. I, can I add one more of thing course. that I don't know Absolutely. that everyone... In order to remember, this is not a little business. Yeah. You need the resource. You need manpower, you need a market, and you need capital, money, to do this. And this was a local, uh, initially a local enterprise. They built a dam, they built ice houses, I'll show those to you in a minute. Um, they, had a, they had to know how to, you know, they had to find markets, the ships had to come. Where do you think they, the money would have come from? Yeah. And now you have to think about South Bristol history. Boston. <laughs> no, think of indiv an individual or individuals. This was a local, initially was a local business. And the men that started it. Yeah. Who had the money to do Wayne. it? Shipbuilders. George. Sh Wayne. Not shipbuilders. You're close. Ship they were ship they were sea captains oh. primarily. Now Blaney is a different person. We can he probably had his finger in everything, but um, a number of these people who lived in uh, um, uh, Clark's Cove at the time, built gentlemen farms and that sort of thing, um, were sea captains and good ones, and they made big bucks. They were, it was a hard life, but they made good money. They retired with plenty of money, and they, they were the initial source to start this ice company because ice was a big business. It was going great guns, and they saw the potential to get into it locally. So capital is, it, 
and I, it's the same thing with bricks. Brick making, I don't know, some of you may have heard my talk on brick making. You need capital, and you need people who could, you know, can run a business. That sort of stuff too. So, workers so, so and, you, and and uh, smart people. And but again, if you look at the way David, Dave's parsing this out, you know, at, you know, looking at all those components that are needed, you know, that kind of gives you an idea of the historical research that goes into figuring out something. Something like this, absolutely. So, you, so you've got the capital, you've got the workers, you've got the ships, you've got the, you know, the water transport, you've got the dam to keep the, the separation. You need what do you need to cut the actually cut the ice? Tools, 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 and manpower. And you've seen, I mean, you've seen examples of that in the Thompson Ice House, I think most of you. And then the big question of how you get the ice from where you cut it to where you want to store it in order to ship it. Let me explain this yeah. picture just a little bit. This is um, the, uh, um, just over that, where the road disappears is where the bridge and the sawmill was. I'm looking back that way. I'm almost in dirt rooters. I'm almost at the top of the hill. Is, so the, is Centennial Hall behind us? Oh, Centennial Hall is okay. back up on It's back, the other back, way. Back, back, okay. back, back right. in the trees up. Uh, okay. and the spot that I want you to, if you've been there at all, is right here. And if you have ever been here with the leaves off and you drive through here, this is a very deep sort of cut right there. You'd think it, you know, geez, that looks you know, like the big stream were coming. But on this side, there's hardly anything. It's just a little, little low, shallow thing. It's kind of, mm -hmm. to me, it doesn't, it, it didn't look natural. The first time I, I sort of new already, but it, it doesn't really look natural if you, if you think about it. And the reason is, ta-da, I took the picture standing about here looking down the road. This is the first dip. This is, uh, th these are, a lot of these ice cutting pictures are from Dirk and Linda Bruner. Amazing find, amazing story which I will tell afterwards about these being saved from a fire. Here's the ice field. This is the deep gully. There's a conveyor. They run the ice in there. There's a conveyor that goes under the road and lifts it all the way up to here, up behind. And then they, the phrase is, run the ice down through conveyors into these buildings, these storage buildings. On the riverside. On the river, yeah. The front of that is, and I'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So that deep gully is really where this conveyor system was. And, and if you look carefully, you can actually see the break in the cover there. See this break right here? That's where the road is. And that's where it gets, I think, so exciting, right? You just take something that you kind of look at, at, a, at a scene and you think something doesn't quite look you know, natural, and you go from that to understanding what you need for the ice harvesting operation what, what and all the different things, and then where were they, and why were they placed there? Yeah. I'm sorry? What would run the conveyor? Horsepower? No, uh, they had, it, no, no, it would have been a steam, steam driven. It, it was, a, you know, uh, I'd, I'd have to ask Dirk if he knows where the steam system was, but it would have been steam power. Yeah, no, it, this is a major. Um, all of the big ice places on the Kennebec all had these low. They had to lift it up to the top, as high up as they could lift it. Even when you watch ice cut the Thompson, they take it way up and then slide it down. It's the same operation, only in a much, much, much bigger scale. Um, okay, this is... Yeah, what are we looking at here? This is, again, let me just quickly go back here. This is, I, talk, I keep talking about the Bruner house. This is the Bruner's house, and that isn't there anymore. You want to guess what that might be? I'm only guessing, but I bet that's the dormitory or bunk house. But this is, this is that house. The next photograph is taken, I'm standing about here, looking down towards the water. So this one, I would think would be easy. You know what's got to be there. What are we looking at? The back of 
So they're going to slide the blocks all the way down? To There'll the be a mark in there somewhere. I should call your attention to this slide, and in actuality, there's a little ditch that runs. Where is it? It runs up here. It runs straight across, and then it runs straight down. It's a little shallow drainage ditch. It's a rectangle. Oh, it's a canal. It's the ice houses. It's the ice houses. There we are. There's that. If, if you know, if you go up there, and, and I, Dirk, Dirk will probably let you walk down there. After he's mowed that field and walked down there, you can. They had, you know, they they would. The ice was still melting in the ice house a little bit, and they had always had a little bit of water, you know, associated with it. So they had a little drainage ditch all the way around. Mm -hmm. um, I I never saw it in the picture here, but I know from other pictures they had a drainage ditch around just to get this icy water out and. That's still there. It's the only remnant, but it is crystal clear once you see it. There are also a few chunks of concrete and some other some rings in the rocks that would be probably part of the the, the conveyor system or the, the run system. But there you go. And again, and not, not to be pedantic about it, but why do you need the ice storage? Why don't you just you know? Slide it right down onto the onto the uh, onto the ship. Why is it so important to have storage? You want to sell it in the summer, not in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, it's not always going to be right ready to load in the, the right season of year, right? Oh, okay. and, I wish I wish I included that slide. Um, this is the dock. You see, this is so this is the run out. They run it out, and it's hard to see in this picture, but there's a gantry block lifting system that would pick it up and, and kind of set it over and set it down in the hole and then they pushed it around in the hole of the boat in the same way they pushed the block you've seen anybody who's been in the ice cutting has seen them do that. They just pictured in a much grander scale. But this is deep water. It was a good place. So have we covered I'm trying to think if we've covered all of the all of the ingredients that are essential there. I think we have, and somebody mentioned the wharves, obviously, which are, are crucial as well. But you see, again, you'd have to have the, not, a little bit of the knowledge of the ice harvesting operation, wouldn't you, to know what it was that you were you were looking for. And um, and then when you start to look for those things, um, then you, you know you begin to see that evidence in the in the landscape. And and you know not all of us can do it, and it takes that training and that understanding. But it's it's well worth that, that pursuit. I just wanted to mention in this, um, again, we have in, in this slide. Um, I just, that's just a little bit. These are the guys. These are the guys yeah, um, yeah, you're just you're sure. artists, right? Another view of the ice harvest thing. Great. Well, that's, that's what I just put in there. That's exactly what we have. All right. Um, so I, I wanted to mention um, just a couple of things, and then I, we're going to wrap up in a, just a um, in about 10 minutes here. Um, but, uh, you know, you can, you can do this with, you know, clusters of um, houses and buildings. You can look at old maps and say, well, you know, where, where would the general store have been? Where were these other public buildings? Where were um, places where people gathered, whether it was Centennial Hall or some kind of other community hall? Where were the meeting houses? Why were the meeting houses where they were? Why were the cemeteries where they were? You know, why were the roads where they were? Why were the walls where they were? Um, you can look at where the schoolhouses were. You can look at all those other kinds of things that aren't just residences. And you know, all these things that are related to industry here. And, and again, ask that question, why were they placed here? Because it's again, it's not random. Um, you know, it usually indicates that this, this kind of hub of activities is in a particular place for a particular reason. And, and I did want to mention um, that, um, you know, when we start to look at these clusters of, uh, you know, where people were um, at various places on the Bristol Peninsula, this changes over time. So that hub of, of, of activity at Clark's Cove eventually diminishes, but at the same time, there are other places that begin begin to be hubs of activity, um, residential and commercial and kind of civic public gathering. So what were some of those other places on the peninsula? Well, this, let me, yeah. I'll do, this is 
believe it or not, a 1774 map. Right. The, these lighter colored areas are open fields. The black okay. dots are houses and barns. I just, I, I'm going to compare here uh, Clark's Cove and the river to um, uh, the island and, and right. South Bristol Village. Excellent. I have a few sets of maps, so I'll just do it quick. Um, and all you need to do is look. You don't really need to be able to read anything. But this is Clark's Cove. You can see a lot of fields. And then this is the upper river here. And I can assure you there's nothing down here. This is, so I don't know how many houses and barns and fields there are there. This is, here's, here's the, the village in Rutherford Island. Don't bother to count it. I have, there are five. Mm -hmm. 70, 74. Whoa, all right. And why? Pretty simple, isn't it? People were, this is farmers coming in. There's not much you're going to farm down on Rutherford Island or in the village. Oh, wow. I, I can tell you that. You can attest to that. Okay. This is, this is uh, almost 100 years later. Again, it's, it's fuzzy. The important thing is here's Fox Cove, and, and these are names. But you can see that there's really about the same number of names as there were little black dots. This, this is the northern part of the river. Oh, there's maybe a few more houses there, but it's roughly the same sort of feeling. But now look at <coughs> South Bristol. See all the names? And those are all people. And this, these are residents, not our summer friends. <laughs> so something has happened, and this, started, this has started to grow. It started to grow. And why? And then you ask the question, why? Why is the... Why is the center of activity changed to, to where, where it is going out there? Shipbuilding. Fishing. 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 Yeah. Fishing. Yes. Yeah. There was shipbuilding. There was shipbuilding here, but there was shipbuilding all the way up and down the river as far as the other side of the Great Salt Bay. Um, fishing. In the 30s, um, all, you know, at first there were farmers, but later on as, as uh, the, the fishing industry grew for a variety of reasons, um, these people were almost all associated with the sea. Seamen, merchants, you know, there were captains, there were, you know, a barber and a, a couple of grocery stores, but this is mostly, these people are almost all um, maritime. One more quick. Sure. This is um, pretty recent, well, 1970 topo map. I haven't shown the river. This is Clark's Cove. Uh, there's a few more dots there. Um, but not a whole heck of a lot, a few up in here. But look at Rutherford Island and the village. In particular, look at this mm -hmm. down here. Why are there so many houses down there and when there weren't a uh, hundred years before? Well, how many of you people live in some of those houses? <laughs> it's obvious this is the, the who became a summer resident. Like, As you said, somebody said rusticators, summer residents. Yeah. Well, yeah, summer residents. Yeah. And so, again, looking at the maps, and if you drive around, I mean, it's obvious, but still, you can you can read the full history. Mm -hmm. that. And again, you think about why you you know may live if you live in one of those houses here and now. Like, what what was it that you were looking for when you decided to settle here? What were the things that were important to you? Why here for you? And again, you can go through that same exercise for your own self. And, and I think that's, that's what, and a whole, again, a whole different set of values that might have a lot to do with, you know, the setting and all of that, and didn't have to do with trying to earn a living from, from the land or the, or the resources that were here on the land. I wanted to, just as we're, we're kind of um, finishing up, Dave. Um, yeah, just a couple. Yeah, and there's one thing that I wanted to make. Oh, yeah, let's look at this one. And then My we'll favorite. Work one. Yeah. My favorite. Yeah. <laughs> it's your favorite. I can't I took it. Why. Yeah, yeah, I have yeah. my own photography. <laughs> what are we looking at here? Everyone, this is the Gamish. This is uh, that little coal there is Elliot's coal. This is uh, the Gamish shipyard marina in the background. Mm -hmm. And that wharf, the stone wharf is on their property. So you see it when you drive down shipyard road. I see it out of my bedroom. For those of us who don't live right here, you kayak near it. <laughs> right. The bridge is on. Yeah. What does, to me, that that photograph encompasses probably the, almost the whole history of uh, Rutherford Island. And, I mean, the lower South Bristol Village in Rutherford Island. 
This, we have no idea how old this is. I mean, there's no evidence, but it is of the type that goes back to the fishing days. Now, there are drawings of 1550 with a stone pier that looked like that. So, and the uh, Gamage Yard and that area has always been um, water-based activities. It was either, you know, they built boats there, they brought fish ashore there, they dried cod there. It's always been a marine thing. Um, and it's clearly right, right that's through, important. Right but what do we have in the background? You know, today we have, you know, we have power boats and lobster boats. And, um, but the talk about continuity, I mean, yeah, continuity yeah. going right, right, right through yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, uh, you can see the whole, you can see the whole history, you can visualize the whole history of town by looking at Yeah, in a, in a nutshell there. So I want to, just two things to, to finish this up with. Um, a couple weeks ago when I was with Dave, um, we were looking at place names, we were looking at names of roads um, and how much those names can tell us. Um, and there's one road, one road called what, Brickyard Road, Brickyard, Brickyard Farm, Farm Road. road. And, and I have to say that, you know, I, I love the way Dave's mind works because he was saying, okay, so for brick making, these are the things that you would need. Just the same thing we did before. These are the things you'd need to have a brick making operation. So therefore, these are the things that we would expect to find traces of down this road. And anybody want to guess what some of them might have been? What you need for a brick making operation? Clay. 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 Good point. <laughs> Firewood. Wood. What? Alright. Straw. straw. Say it again. Straw sometimes. Straw, okay. Well, yeah. actually, I'm sorry. Yeah. Not, not, not straw. Not straw. Yeah. You needed water. Right. Fred, you had to build some fresh water fresh pond water, and right. mud. Or you needed a source of fresh water. Yeah. Not a huge amount. Which we, we're still trying to find, right? In that area? Well, I, I, I can postulate where it is. Okay. But, um, and, and you're talking about a large flat place that you needed? For well, relatively level. has to be beside the water. Yeah, you got to get it out. We have five, and, and I can tell you all five have all the elements, but in some it's much more pronounced than others. I mean, you know, these are all the sites. This one isn't. Um, yeah, you need, and I won't talk about manpower and capital, but you need, you need the clay. You need water to mix with the clay to make a slurry because uh, the clay is really dry. You need enough space to lay out bricks. This, uh, just jump to the slide. This is, this is the other end of the road. If you go all the way to the end of the road, you'll see a stone wall like this with bricks. There's bricks scattered all Did over the Did you all see you saw the little couple of bricks? Yeah. And those are burnt bricks, so you know they burnt here. Mm -hmm. This, is, there, are no, there are no pictures of South Bristol brickyards. This one is, is in, um, I think Berwick on, on, on anyway, it's, it's down there somewhere. And it just en encapsulates almost everything there. Um, you need a place to mix the clay and water together. That's just off the screen where you see that boom and the horse. That's called a mill. They just turn, it makes it a uniform pug slurry. Pug. 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 Well, yeah, I mean, a pug mill would be one of them. Then they, they have to lay the bricks out to dry, so you have to have enough space, you know, you're, you're doing tens of thousands of bricks. So they need to lay out and sun dry, and then you need a place, and that's mostly what you see here, and then when they're dry, you need to stack them up and make a kiln. You use the bricks to make this giant oven, and then you fire the oven, so you need a place to store, you know, 100 quarter wood, it's big. And then to load it, you need, need uh, a boat. You need some place close by to load it because it's a double the job. You wheel it up with wheelbarrows. And that's what you see in the background. You can see a two-master, a smaller boat there in the background. Mm -hmm. And we have that there at, at, um, at the end of Brickyard uh, uh, Farm Road. Uh, curiously. Not as clear as some of the other places. Seems like that's a labor-intensive operation. It, it, it didn't take, well, you're probably looking at most of the crew. The gentleman in the foreground is actually um, dragging up or ripping up the clay. Um, and uh, I don't see a wheel, oh yeah, there's a gentleman, I think that's a wheelbarrow right here. So they're taking wheelbarrows.
wheel barrel to play up or ramp, and then the pulley wheel is here, they drop it in, the horse, the old sad blind horse would walk round and round and round and uh, churn it up. They'd open up the bottom and take the slurry out in, uh, you know, in boxes that were clay size. They'd carry those out and dump them and let them air dry so they could handle each clay block, each brick block, excuse me. And those of you who have ever found them, you can find those with fingerprints and fingers. Mm -hmm. If you want to touch the past, you can put your yes. finger right in the same place. And then when they were that, then they would build this um, clamp, it was called, the tunnels underneath, plastered over with mud, and then build a fire in there. And that fire might go day and night for a week, 10 days, and it would, it would rise up through and it would bake all the bricks. And then it would cool, they would bring a small, most of these um, were relatively shallow water. They weren't huge vessels. That might even be a gunnelo, for all I know. Uh, anyway, and they'd, they'd, they'd flat them out. They'd let them sit on the bottom at low tide. And most of these are in narrow, shallow water. They're not in deep water. They've cleared all the rocks off. And then they'd, they'd, the boat would sit on the bottom, and they would wheelbarrow at a time, wheel all the made bricks into the boat, and they would go to Boston. They would go to New York and they would go to St. John's. It was only, it was intensive when those cities burned all at about the same time. And the mandate was don't build wood, build yeah. brick. Yeah. So Huge everybody did. So yeah. one, at the, one at, at Brickyard Farm is a real small, probably the smallest one actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, so amazing, that, amazing industry for a short period of time, but in intense, intense demand. So just to kind of finish this up quickly, because I know we've gone on um, fairly long, I, I would be remiss because um, uh, I'm an archivist as well as a historian, um, that, that obviously the landscape alone cannot give us all the evidence that we need. So we need to have things that complement the observations and uh, research in the landscape, so just different kinds of of documents, and they're just showing us examples of some of the ones, land divisions, probate inventories, obviously company records, maps, um, uh, you know, census records, um, all those different things have to work together, right, in order to be able to do that, that kind of uh, research that we need. So we're just showing these as examples of other kinds of records that you would use to supplement the, the work uh, on, on the landscape itself. And I think our final, yeah, well, this is the, mm -hmm. that's your final one, right? Oh, okay. I had a neat one. You said you had a neat one, and you're absolutely right. So our last question to everybody was, um, what other questions do you want to investigate further? Not tonight, obviously, um, but, but what other things do you, burning questions, do you have about South Bristol history that you would love to be able to investigate as a, as a community? We have sheep wall and one of the questions would be, how did they move the sheep around? And how did, where, where are the walls? Because some of them go off into the woods. So the whole battle herding of the sheep and, and how that yeah. worked and how the walls were part of that. Yeah. Notice we never mentioned stone yeah. walls. Yeah, we never did, and we should have. Absolutely should have. Well, again, yeah. again it, it yeah. seems obvious we see yeah. them everywhere. But and Nancy, this is being uses. recorded, so we get these questions on the recording? Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> Great. What other questions? Yeah. I would like to know if there are cannon dumped at the entrance to the gun. Because I heard a rumor that some ship escaped by dumping the cannons and lightning the loads and they escaped kind of the British or whoever was after. Oh, that's the box. That's the battle between the boxer and the enterprise. And but, uh, where are the cannons? Well, um, and I, there is a book. Uh, we're not. We're not going to. No, we're going to answer. We're not going to go answer it. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Come yeah. see me afterwards, and I'll tell you exactly where to go to read about. This is the answer man here. I guess it's just interesting. Nancy knows the answer, don't she? Not in the gut. I didn't know they were. Well, he's actually. I, I think <laughs> he's talking about the COVID lessons. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Uh, yeah, well, any other, any other burning, any other burning questions? These are good. This is not. The, they're not going to get answered. They will. Um, any other burning questions? Yes. 
um, it's really, the question is, anyone done a study of the land, um, how much of it was open and how that's changed? Ah, right, right. The farms, you have to find out whether the farms were working farms. And yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. And how much of that, at what query was the maximum amount of open land and when did it start to reforest? Yeah, that's a, that's a great one. And it sounds like you want to look at that. That's a good subject to explore. That. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah. The quarrying industry would be interesting. Quarrying industry, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so many of these industries were short-lived, right? And they, they arose to meet a great demand and or created the demand. In the case of the ice cream, you have to create the demand, too. Um, but a really, really interesting one. And then we have this picture. Yeah. I'm, I'm, we have any idea? Do you know? Well, I'm going to just break. I don't know, know how many people are familiar with Bill Bunting. He's a, a main historian and author, uh, author of a number of wonderful books. Uh, the two that are always famous are um, A Day's Work, photographic books. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in, in the introduction of one of those books, he talks about sitting at the traffic light in Richmond, Maine, waiting to go across the bridge uh, and looking up and down the river. And he says, what I see are the steamers towing the boats, the big three-masted schooners up to load uh, the lumber that was cut in, in, in uh, Hollowell and the stone that was cut in Hollowell and in Augusta. He's, that's visual archaeology, vis yeah. vis vis visible history. Yeah. He, uh, sure so I want to leave you with this picture. This is Route 129. <laughs> <laughs> it is Route I, I, I don't care if it is or isn't. This is Route 129. And those folks are grading the road. This is a horse drawn grader. And you see all the men there and all the horses? These men are working off their taxes by grading the road. So the next time you're scooting along up 129 and the traffic slows, don't look at the traffic. Well, keep your eyes on the road. But see if you can bring up this image at construction site. That would be even better. Next time you hit a construction site or you slow down or something, uh, picture this and not yeah. those orange cones. And, and think back on something. what a great idea that was. And that's true in almost all New England towns. You can cross off, as they call it, your taxes by either you know giving supplies that the town needed or doing work for X number of days for the town. For, so people who didn't have that ability to pay the taxes and cash could do that. So that's a lovely, that's a great closing image. <laughs> that's a really wonderful one. Yes? What's the year of that picture? Oh, golly. Um, maybe turn this, I'd have to study it. I don't know. I, it's, it, it actually is a postcard that we know was South Bristol. That's all I can tell you. I haven't studied it to say, but I, it's not all that. that late. That's his next research. Turn project. the century. That, my first instinct would say turn the century. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, 18th to 19th century. Well, thank you all very much for being such great participants.